Hello and welcome everyone to the ninth session of the Massively Online Open Course for the University of Nicosia's Master's Degree in Digital Currencies. We've got a number of questions. Today we'll be talking about alternative uses of the, of the blockchain and uh, have a number of questions already uh, from the forums. And I invite you all to use the live chat to add to those questions as we go through this presentation. Uh, Jim asks, uh, when a coin becomes a sidechain, wouldn't its only value be from the Bitcoin moved to it? So if Litecoin's developer decided to sidechain it, wouldn't the value of Litecoin become zero? Not necessarily. Um, sidechains can be implemented in a number of different ways. One way that sidechains can be implemented is with a sidechain where all of the coins are instantiated from a parent chain through the use of side chains. However, you can also have independent tokens and assets existing on the side chain that are not instantiated from the parent chain, uh, but are mined independently. So there are a number of different ways side chains can be implemented. Um, and it's not quite clear yet uh, how that would affect the value of a side chain asset if such existed. Adam from Kevin asks, um, a big security downside for sidechain technology is that any altcoin on a sidechain can only be mined by those on the main chain, but there is no reward for the guys on the main chain to mine that sidechain. In essence, you would require people on Bitcoin's chain to secure a sidechain for free. That is not exactly how uh, sidechains operate. So, when you are using sidechains, um, that doesn't mean that the sidechain is being mined on Bitcoin. That concept is called merged mining and is different from sidechains. Sidechains allow you to introduce a special form of transaction, which locks uh, coins on one chain and then locks them to an output that can only be released by providing proof of uh, validation on a different chain. So what this will allow you to do is lock coins on one chain and then instantiate them on another chain by providing uh, what's called an SPV proof or sim simple simplified sorry simplified payment verification proof. Uh, simplified payment verification for proof is essentially a uh, proof of uh, work. Uh, so either a list of headers or uh, proof of a blockchain work, uh, plus a Merkle path that proves the existence of a specific output within that proof of work. Uh, this uh, type of proof is already used by simplified payment verification or lightweight clients in order to validate transactions on the Bitcoin network. What we're talking about here is being being able to use a uh, SPV proof as a form of encumbrance on a, on an output within a transaction. That means you lock a specific amount of coin in an output that can only be unlocked by providing an SPV proof from another chain. Now, what that allows you to do is is essentially move coins from one chain to another uh, and um, cr create a bidirectional pipe or as it's called a peg between two different chains. So the primary chain, the parent chain, if you like, if we're talking about Bitcoin and a side chain, the, the parent chain being Bitcoin and the side chain being another chain, the parent chain doesn't do any additional mining. In fact, the only change to the parent chain is the introduction of a new script operand, something like uh, op sidechain verify or something like that, which would, instead of verifying a digital signature or some other form of verification, would verify an SPV proof from a sidechain as the unlocking script in order to release the coins in the, parents, in the parent chain. Now, again, this is rather complicated technology. Uh, the white paper is about 25 pages to read for sidechains, and it is fairly dense. 
but essentially what you're saying is I'm going to lock coins on this chain and uh, they can only be unlocked if you prove to me that um, that an output exists on another chain that has uh, also locked coins on another chain. So that way you can move things back and forth between chains. Let's see if we have... Um, so sidechains, uh, Kevin asks a similar question about um, sidechains and the vulnerability to mining. Sidechains really don't change the underlying proof of work algorithm, and they don't change how coins or chains are mined. What they allow you to do simply is move coins from one chain to another using a completely decentralized mechanism that's built into the chains, rather than, for example, an exchange. Um, they don't change the actual mining algorithm. Um, Michael asks, are sidechains infinitely scalable in terms of number of transactions and content? Well, on a very basic level, nothing is infinitely scalable, but um, sidechains are, are relatively scalable. They introduce an SPV proof as a transaction mechanism, and that's quite a bit larger than most transactions today. So there's uh, work underway to find ways to compress SPV proofs, especially the uh, proof of work aspect of those SPV proofs, also known as the DMMS. But um, the sidechains are, uh, you know, as scalable as Bitcoin is today, and so um, they don't introduce ma major scalability issues. So, are they infinitely scalable? No, nothing is infinitely scalable, but they are relatively scalable. Could sidechains use up too many Bitcoins? Um, well. Uh, for example, if every blog entry and every web page and every transaction was committed to a proof of existence scheme, I, I don't want to confuse proof of existence and side chains, but suffice it to say that you can lock up any amount of coins as you want in a parent chain to instantiate in a side chain. Arguably, if you find enough value in the side chain to make it to be willing to temporarily, uh, lock up some bitcoins to resurrect their value in another chain, uh, then that side chain is quite valuable. Um, so I, I wouldn't call that using up too many bitcoins. Uh, it's really a matter of value transfer between chains. Uh, in terms of proof of existence, yes, if you introduced proof of existence for every type of content that exists on the internet, you would very, very quickly overwhelm the capacity of the blockchain to manage that many transactions and that much data. But there are ways to aggregate proof of existence, for example, in a sidechain structure where uh, you only publish uh, a compressed proof, such as a Merkle root in uh, Bitcoin, and that could represent the summary of thousands or tens of thousands of hashes from different uh, types of content. And you could therefore simply encode just a Merkle root and prune the rest. So there are ways to optimize even a massive uh, proof of existence scheme using blockchain technology. Could a decentralized trustless exchange be built that uses a simple smart contract and bid ask system to exchange value without any intermediaries? Um, Michael, that would be fantastic if somebody could build a decentralized trusted exchange with smart contracts. The technology does not exist today. Um, there are lots of people working on this because a decentralized trustless exchange would actually uh, deliver many, many significant benefits uh, in the space of cryptocurrencies. So um, you can think of side chains as a type of decentralized trustless exchange, especially if you're talking about atomic swaps, which is a feature within or possibility that's opened up using sidechains to um, atomically swap currencies from one chain to another. But um, 
you know, this is still in very much in the development phase. So it's all exciting development, but not currently something that can be done with existing technology. Uh, if somebody could do it, I think they would already be building it. And, and maybe somebody is already building it. Uh, Nick has been playing around with doing his own proof of existence solution, and this is how it works. First, he calculates the SHA-256 hash of the document whose existence he wants to prove. Then he uses that hash output as the private key and determines the public address from that uh, private key, or the public key and then the Bitcoin address. Uh, he then sends a small amount of Bitcoin to that address, and after it's confirmed, he sends the Bitcoin back to himself. Uh, he can now prove that the existence of that document at the time of confirmation, and um, with effectively the fact that there is a transaction. Uh, Nick's question is whether there is some bad behavior, side effect with this approach to blockchain, or any other aspect for miners. There are no unspent outputs since the money was removed, uh, but it is very cheap since it only requires two miners' fees. Is this approach reasonable? Um, yes, it, it is reasonable. How, however, there is a feature within Bitcoin as of version uh, 0 0.9, which allows you to do this with only one miner's fee and only a single transaction without actually creating any unspent outputs. And that function is called op return, op return. And op return is a uh, script operand that allows you to embed up to 40 bytes of data into the blockchain as a provably unspendable output, an output that is not considered uh, part of the UTXO set, that is known to be data by all. Uh, this is mined as part of a normal transaction. It doesn't have to have any value attached to it, so you can set, create a, a zero value output with no Bitcoin sent to it. Um, that creates an op return, and um, you can just pay the fee. Uh, very simply, the way you would do that is uh, source from one of your Bitcoin addresses as the input, uh, create two outputs in a transaction, one op return that encodes the proof of existence of the document you want to prove, and one that sends um, the uh, input back to your original address as change, with the only difference being a small fee for the miners. That transaction would create uh, two outputs, it would encode your proof of existence, you'd pay one minor fee, you'd get the rest back and change on your original address, there'd be no value locked up in the op return, and you don't need to do any of this um, uh, public-private key manipulation, uh, because the protocol actually offers a direct way of doing this without a kludge. So, but that doesn't mean that your approach isn't reasonable, it, it is reasonable, um, and uh, there is, um, uh, however, a slightly easier way to do it. Uh, interestingly enough, that is uh, the method being used by the University of Nicosia to embed the certificate numbers for uh, successful completion of the course. So after the course is completed, each student is issued a certificate number, and that certificate number is, uh, I believe it's a hash of their name or something like that, and the, and the, um, the uh, instance of the MOOC that they completed or date. Uh, all of those certificate numbers are put inside a document, and then the document's uh, hash, the proof of existence of that document, is sent as a single transaction with an op return output um, directly into the um, blockchain. So. Uh, one proof per student, but that's not encoded in the blockchain. All of the proofs are then put into a single document, and that single document uh, has proof of existence in the blockchain. What that allows anyone to do is uh, validate uh, from the master list, which is proven, um, the uh, name of each student, and then validate that that student has completed the MOOC course. So it's a way to only put one proof of existence, single, a single entry with just 40 bytes, of data into the blockchain, but encode all of the students who participated in the MOOC, and that scales quite nicely. So that's the method used by the course.
We've got some additional questions from uh, the previous iteration of the MOOC, so I'm going to uh, dive into these questions. And in the meantime, if you have any more questions in the forum, please uh, put them in the chat right now. How does a smart contract eliminate the possibility of any signatory defaulting on their obligations? Um, this really depends on your definition of smart contract and how it's implemented. The most common forms of smart contract that we see implemented in practice today are multi-signature escrow transactions. And in a multi-signature escrow transaction, the transaction cost for a purchase, for example, or uh, a contract, is put in escrow in advance of the completion of the contract with a third party acting as an escrow agent. Now, what that means is that if one of the signature signatories defaults on their obligations, then you can uh, launch a dispute process. Uh, you could do it through the courts, but uh, for most smart contracts, it makes more sense to use uh, an arbitration process, which is uh, internationally recognized. And then based on the result of that arbitration process, the escrow agent would create a transaction, essentially uh, giving the escrow amount either to the buyer or to the seller, depending on uh, who was in the right. So a signatory defaulting on their obligations will lose the escrow amount. And uh, that's, the, that's a practical use of smart contracts today. Um, and um, it uses multi-signature escrow. Um, another question we have here, is there any way to use Namecoin not just for the .bit domain, but more generally? Well, yes, you could use Namecoin for a number of different things, including um, there are actually already uh, about half a dozen namespaces that are encoded in the Namecoin chain, uh, including domain entries for the .bit domain, user identifiers, uh, various PGP keys, things like that. Um, if you're asking if you can use it more generally than the .bit domain for other domains, well, then really the issue is uh, an issue of resolution. So, in order to resolve the .bit domain, you have to add a custom resolver into your browser as a plugin, or into your edge router that uses uh, a Namecoin blockchain or a Namecoin blockchain connected uh, proxy server to resolve domains. Now, um, you could use a Namecoin blockchain to do .com, for example, uh, because none of the current participants of the .com system uh, would give up their claims or participate in a system where they have no control. So uh, it is unlikely that you could use it in a generalized fashion, but you could use it instead of a .bit domain, uh, you could use it for any other top level domain that doesn't currently exist. You could register a top level domain and specify that its resolution happens through this system. Uh, you could even create uh, root servers for a top level domain. That would of course represent centralization of the Namecoin system, uh, but it would be an effective way of bringing that to mainstream temporarily. Uh, Michael asks, uh, how do off-chain transactions work? Um, well, they work the same way that, um, that uh, most financial transactions work today, which means that uh, two parties or, or multiple of parties exchange value through a centralized and not cryptographically verified ledger or registry using a clearinghouse. And that clearinghouse acts as a trusted authority. And um, as long as the transactions are between parties using that clearinghouse, then those transactions are settled internally. And if the transactions are between parties from that clearinghouse and perhaps another clearinghouse, uh, then those transactions are settled externally. Uh, let's see an example. Um, let's say, for example, that you're looking at the um, check clearinghouse here in the United States. So if I write a check in US dollars to another person in my own bank, then that's going to be cleared internally by my own bank. If I write a check to uh, another bank, then that's going to be cleared by a clearinghouse to which both of these banks subscribe. 
and uh, after all of the checks of the day between those two banks are cleared, there might be a transfer of balance, um, you know, the net difference between all of those amounts uh, between those two banks to settle any uh, overbalance, uh, essentially from all of those transactions. And, and this keeps going up hierarchically. So if if you do checks between countries, you know, then you have uh, net balances between banks of different countries with exchange rates and all of all kinds of other things like that. So off-chain transactions really work like that, which is let's say for example you're using Coinbase and Coinbase operates off-chain transactions, which means that if I send Bitcoin from one Coinbase account holder to another Coinbase account holder, that does not create a transaction on the Bitcoin blockchain. What it does is it updates two database entries in the Coinbase uh, internal centralized database. Now, as long as you trust Coinbase to maintain those balances correctly and to manage the security of that database, then Coinbase acts as a clearinghouse. If at some point you transfer a Bitcoin outside of Coinbase, then that Bitcoin transaction is recorded on the blockchain as a net transaction from Coinbase. And so the off-chain transactions uh, happen within a centralized clearinghouse context. Uh, so the follow-up question by Michael is, what prevents double spending? And, and the answer is uh, the clearinghouse manager, the, the third party, the trusted central authority. So in the example before, Coinbase prevents double spending between Coinbase account holders on internal Coinbase transactions. And that's, that's exactly how the entire financial system works in terms of having to trust a central authority or clearinghouse. So um, the, the, the difference with the Bitcoin blockchain is that there is no central party or clearinghouse that is done as a distributed function of the network. So let's see if we have any more questions on the forum, follow-up questions to anything we've discussed so far. I'm going to check in with the forum and see what's going on there. We have some side discussions. Uh, Michael asks, um, Blockstream received uh, funding in November. Any idea when they will be offering a Bitcoin improvement proposal? No, have no idea um, we're going to see. Uh, sidechains at the moment are a theoretical proposal, and we haven't seen either a standard or an implementation suggested. But, you know, arguably... The people who are part of that company are currently working on that. Another question from the chat room. Is there any reason to not allow sidechains to operate with Bitcoin? Are there any significant risks that you can foresee? Um, I, I can't at the moment foresee any significant risk with allowing sidechains to operate with Bitcoin. The change that needs to be introduced for sidechains to be possible is a relatively simple um, script addition. It uh, it does not allow uh, it does not make any changes to the underlying security of the Bitcoin system. It doesn't allow any uh, new avenues of attack, and most importantly, it is a voluntary system. So if if people want to send their Bitcoin to a sidechain, they will have a choice to do that. Nobody's going to force anyone to send Bitcoin to a sidechain. They have to create and sign a transaction that implements a sidechain transaction type. And uh, if people want to do that, they'll do it. And if they don't want to do it, they won't do that. Arguably, it's difficult to even stop sidechains from happening, even if there wasn't consensus, because uh, as long as someone with mining power uh, decides that they want to mine transactions with that operand script, they can consider them valid and mine them. So, um, so you may see those operate within Bitcoin, whether people like it or not. But I don't see any reason why sidechains would not um, be a good idea for the Bitcoin system. Kirk asks, um, could Coinbase use a sidechain for their internal transactions 
to create more transparency and reduce the clearinghouse risk you described. Um, yeah, absolutely, they could. Uh, not quite sure what the benefit would be, because um, there's no significant additional benefit from between that and uh, using the Bitcoin blockchain. Uh, Sidechains don't eliminate the need uh, to do mining. They don't eliminate the need to pay fees. They don't eliminate the cost of security. So if you had such a scheme, if uh, if Coinbase was responsible for a sidechain all on their own, if they ran that sidechain, then the risk is concentrated again in Coinbase. Doesn't really make any difference. Um, and if it was mined openly, then there's not much difference from the Bitcoin blockchain. I'm not quite sure what the benefit is. Um, arguably, uh, using off blockchain transactions and an internal uh, database offers Coinbase lower costs and simplicity at the cost of centralization and having to trust Coinbase. Um, their business model is that that is a uh, worthy trade-off. And so far, many customers seem to agree with that. So um, I don't see why they would want to do that. But it certainly is possible. Um, is the fact that some Bitcoin core developers are working with Blockstream, the company that makes side chains or is making side chains, of any concern to you? Are there potential conflicts of interest that would mean uh, that could harm Bitcoin in the long run, or corner its development towards Blockstream's business interests? Um, no, that doesn't concern me. The the fact of the matter is that core developers have no more or less power to make changes to the Bitcoin software than anybody else. Uh, they can propose changes, and if the rest of the community of developers accepts those changes, then they will be introduced in a new version of Bitcoin. However, that doesn't uh, force any of the miners to adopt that new version of Bitcoin, or even to adopt that new version of Bitcoin with all the features. Um, if people don't like that version, they can not upgrade or they can uh, change the code to remove that specific feature and then upgrade everything else. And cherry picking changes, for example. Ultimately, um, the control over which version of Bitcoin is running and what features it has lies with the miners who have the consensus mechanism, but also with merchant processing companies, uh, wallet companies, etc., etc., that create transactions. So uh, the control over Bitcoin is spread in a very diffuse manner, and um, there's nothing magical about a core developer. A core developer is simply someone broadly recognized as uh, someone who develops on the Bitcoin core reference implementation and is contributing to it. So um, they don't have any magical powers. Uh, they can't change the underlying consensus mechanism. And they can't introduce changes to the codes that are not uh, popular and desired by the rest of the community. Um, another question. What are the advantages or disadvantages of colored coins compared to Ethereum or side chains? Well, th those are three very, very different uh, technologies. So, colored coins are uh, bitcoins that have additional metadata associated with them, so that a chain of transactions with um, small bitcoin amounts can represent. Uh, a series of transactions of another asset. For example, I can create a colored coin by taking a small amount of Bitcoin and coloring it to represent a number of tokens that are, for example, um, uh, 
discount vouchers for buying a book. And then I could issue these colored coins and I could sell them to people uh, for Bitcoin. I could uh, trade them with people. I could transfer ownership from one person to another using the normal Bitcoin transaction mechanism. Because those, all of those transactions can be traced back to a single transaction where those coins were colored in the first place, uh, compatible wallets that understand colored coins can recognize their special metadata properties and identify which asset category they belong to and identify that they represent tokens um, of other assets. The, the way I can describe this best is, let's say you took a stack of brand new crisp dollar bills, a hundred of them, and you said uh, you took a rubber stamp and you stamped on the front of the one dollar bill and you said one share of an Andreas Corp. Uh, and you created a new corporation, you issued a hundred shares, and you stamped something on the front of each dollar bill and you said these dollar bills are now share certificates. Now, they're still worth a dollar as a dollar bill, theoretically at least. You could take them to the store and they'd probably take them even though they look weird. Um, but they also have an additional meaning. So you should you could say by your articles of incorporation that anybody who presents the bearer of uh, a dollar bill with that stamp on it and the appropriate signature is a shareholder of one of the hundred shares of that corporation. So essentially you've given the piece of paper that carries the dollar bill or piece of cotton that carries the dollar bill, you've now given it additional meaning by adding some metadata on the surface of that um, cotton that gives it additional meaning. And uh, that dollar bill is simultaneously a dollar bill and a share certificate for your corporation. You could theoretically do that. Colored coins are like that. You're taking minuscule amounts of Bitcoin and you're adding additional meaning to them. Ethereum uh, is a system that has a completely separate chain which can process instead of transactions, it processes contracts, and these contracts can be written in a language, a scripting language that is bytecode-like um, and Turing complete. So uh, that is still um, only exists in the uh, beta or alpha stage. Uh, some prototypes and proof of concepts have been developed, and I certainly use them. They're very interesting. Uh, currently doesn't exist. On the other hand, colored coins you can use today. You can uh, use a colored coin wallet. You can create assets uh, that are colored coins. They can be recorded on the blockchain. You can transact them. Uh, side chains is still a paper uh, and would be a method for moving coins from one chain to another. So three very different technologies, all providing really extensions on the capabilities of Bitcoin or completely new uh, interpretations of the underlying platform uh, in order to do many, many, many new and interesting things. I think our future will, will involve a combination of a lot of these different technologies. and It's hard to tell at this point which of these technologies will be successful, uh, which will fulfill their original vision and be able to deliver specific applications of value to the end users. Um, but certainly it's a very exciting space because of all of this innovation and uh, all of these diverse developments. Now, let's see what other questions we have. Nicholas says, uh, does increasing off-chain transactions reduce the difficulty and help remove hashing power from the network? Um, not really. Uh, it reduces the transaction volume, but the transaction volume is really completely unrelated to the hashing power for finding blocks. Um, a block is no more difficult to uh, deliver proof of work for whether it consists of one transaction or a million transactions. There is some time required, but it's really in the milliseconds uh, or even less to um, assemble a candidate block with all of the transactions in it. Arguably, a block with fewer transactions is smaller, 
um, and can propagate faster. So you might win the competition by a hair if you can propagate your block faster than others. We see that. Um, arguably, it takes a tiny bit less time to construct a block if it has fewer transactions in it. Uh, but really, those are not uh, compelling differentiators in mining that would affect the overall difficulty of the network or the competition uh, in such a way as to massively be affected by off-chain transactions. So off-chain transactions do not really change the hashing power of the network or the mining difficulty. Another question, um, do you believe that what Overstock and Counterparty are attempting to do, which is decentralize the US stock exchange, is technically possible? Does that mean that the blockchain must scale very much for it to happen? Um, so, uh, first, some background. Uh, Overstock, which is a public company, which means that it has a license by the Securities and Exchange Commission, to uh, create public offerings and offer its uh, shares uh, for sale to the public via stock exchange, uh, has teamed up with Counterparty, which is a meta protocol implement on top of Bitcoin, with the goal of offering uh, shares to the public company directly on top of the Bitcoin blockchain as tradable Counterparty tokens. Uh, the idea here is to disintermediate uh, stock exchange companies like the New York Stock Exchange or NASDAQ or other companies like that, and instead have a completely decentralized clearinghouse implemented for stock trading. Is it technically possible? Uh, certainly is. Um, whether it will be successful and can support the trading volume is yet to be seen. Uh, will the blockchain need to scale? That depends on how exactly it's implemented. If all of the trading was implemented on chain, then probably not. But all of the trading does not need to be implemented on chain in order for this to have a very significant impact on the nature and expectations of what a stock exchange is. Even if uh, the majority of trading was off chain. And, and managed by a clearinghouse, it would still massively globalize and decentralize existing stock exchange companies. So the possibility of decentralized stock exchanges is in, enormously exciting and very um, um, very interesting. And uh, I think this experiment is going to be a, a very interesting experiment in how. Uh, things like that can be disintermediated. What we've seen from previous uh, uses of decentralized technologies like the internet is that they tend to act in waves where uh, layers and layers of intermediaries in different industries are gradually put out of business because transactions and interactions can be executed directly between producers and consumers, sellers and buyers, etc. So the internet removed uh, many layers of intermediaries in many many industries uh, where previously uh, intermediaries were necessary to operate, from classified ads to journalism to video publishing to um, all kinds of uh, functions to real estate you know um where intermediaries were removed so will the blockchain remove uh centralized intermediaries like the stock exchanges um probably not in a direct way yet uh because there are enormous advantages to be had with algorithmic trading and proximity and by proximity i mean network uh microsecond proximity uh, to those trading exchanges. There, there's a reason why uh, the trading activity is concentrated around you know, less than a square mile on the New Jersey shore opposite New York. Um, most of that has to do with algorithmic trading and microseconds latency in being able to execute trades or get quotes from the exchanges. Um, it's unlikely that the blockchain could fulfill that role. However, uh, there are many niches where uh, exchanges 
are used today to trade various commodities that could be disintermediated uh, by the blockchain. And I certainly think that that is the long-term trend. All right, let's see if we have any more questions. Otherwise, we're going to wrap this up. Um, check the forms once again. All right, last chance for questions. All right, we have a we have some potential additional questions, so we're going to give it a bit more time. Again, if you have any questions, please put them into the chat now. And uh, please don't forget that the best way to uh, take advantage of these MOOC sessions is to study the material shortly after the completion of the previous session. Uh, that means tomorrow uh, and in the next few days. Uh, study the material, try to see what questions arise from studying the material, and then prepare four or five questions each and post them on the forums. That way, um, I can answer those questions in the next video session and you can uh, use the chat room primarily for follow-up. So to get most of the value out to this MOOC series, uh, please try to study the material early in the week uh, so that you can prepare your questions in the forums and give me an opportunity to answer those questions and you can get the most value out of this course. Now our next MOOC video uh, coming up, I believe, will be on the twenty seventh, but I'm not entirely sure. So we're going to check the schedule and get back to you on that. Let's see if there are any final questions in the chat room. So Michael is asking about um, value. So um, Bitcoin itself has value, and uh, one of the interesting things about these alternative uses is they may introduce um, additional value on top of the underlying token. Uh, let's go back to the example of stamping a certificate uh, of your shares for your personal company on top of a one dollar bill. Now at that point the dollar bill has value as a dollar bill it also has additional value as a share certificate and it's interesting to look at what the interplay of those two values is let's say for example that as a share certificate it's worth a hundred dollars well in the, or a million dollars well in that case the face value of that dollar bill is really irrelevant and what really matters is the meta value that's introduced by you stamping share certificate information on top of it. Uh, and uh, someone would be a, a fool to trade that share, that's very valuable share certificate, to buy a stick of gum at the, at the local store at a face value of a dollar. Uh, because then the store owner who received this could turn around and use it as a share certificate and get much more value out of it. Um, so the two values really still exist <coughs> independently and on top of each other. Now imagine the opposite scenario where the value of the metadata uh, suddenly decreased. Let's say that the share certificate was suddenly worth 10 cents. Well, at that point, if you really don't believe that this share certificate is ever going to increase in value and it's only worth 10 cents, but the value of the underlying um, coin, in this case the dollar bill, is ten times higher, then maybe you want to go buy something with a dollar bill. 
and ignore the fact that it has metadata on it. And this same logic applies to colored coins. In the case of colored coins, most of these transactions involve very small amounts. Uh, in the tens of thousands of satoshis, uh, which are fractions, tiny, tiny fractions of ten thousandths of a bitcoin or less. And in that case, the face value of that bitcoin, in today's prices at least, is infinitesimally small compared to the theoretical value of whatever metadata you put on top. Now, maybe in the future, say the Bitcoin price goes up, and suddenly those satoshis are worth more than the underlying asset. Well, you could still use them as Bitcoin, and if you have ownership of them, you can ignore the metadata and use the Bitcoin value. Um, but if the asset is worth more than the Bitcoin, then that value supersedes. So that's how the interplay between the two values work. Um, specifically, in the case of counterparty, there's also an additional coin called the counterparty XCP coin. And what that does is it provides a token uh, as an intermediary for exchanging value between all of the other tokens in the system, including Bitcoin. Um, now that's a virtual token that runs on top of Bitcoin, and its value again is as metadata on top of all of the other things that are in a transaction. A counterparty actually now uses the op return parameter. So unlike colored coins, it's not providing metadata to an existing Bitcoin value. It's encoding these transactions into the Bitcoin blockchain and paying a mining fee, but it does not tie up uh, even a small amount of Bitcoin. Those transaction outputs that are used for counterparty all have a value of zero, uh, so no Bitcoin are used as the underlying asset. Um, so th that's a slightly different consideration than colored coins. And in that case, the virtual token XCP is used primarily uh, for internal accounting and trading within the counterparty network. All right, I think that completes all of the questions. Our next scheduled uh, MOOC video is on Saturday, the 27th, at 12 noon Eastern, uh, 5 p.m. GMT or UTC, and at 7 p.m. Eastern European Time. And I look forward to seeing you on January the 27th. Um, before that time, please prepare questions for the MOOC video. If you celebrate the holidays this year, enjoy the holidays. Uh, happy Hanukkah, Merry Christmas, uh, or whatever else you celebrate. Hope to see you back Saturday, December 27th. Uh, enjoy your holidays. Thank you.